Welcome to the Elephant in the Room with Bradley Devlin. Thank you so much for joining us today. We got a lot to get to, a little Stanford issue going on with Ben Shapiro's lecture happening later tonight, as well as Twitter banning political ads. Also, I'll coach you through how to deal with discussions that might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable on campus. So we've got a lot to get to, so let's jump right in. But, I know, there is always a but with me, but before we jump right in, I got to tell you about Turning Point USA's Student Action Summit that's happening again this year from December 19th through the 22nd. As of now, the confirmed speakers are Donald Trump Jr., Charlie Kirk, Ben Shapiro, Rand Paul, Dan Crenshaw, and so many more that have yet to be released. Folks, this is going to be an amazing conference down in West Palm Beach. I mean, hey, you worked hard all semester. Go to West Palm Beach, relax, hear from some of the best names in the conservative movement movement, learn a lot. And if you're interested in attending, make sure you go to www.tpusa.com forward slash event forward slash student action summit for more information. As I said before, the advertisement for Turning Point USA, a lot to get to today. We're going to be unveiling a new segment today. I'm going to have a guest on the podcast, Justin Corbin. He is going to have a lot of great information for you guys explaining what's going on precisely with Twitter's new ban on political advertising. Before we have Justin on, before I get to Bradley's breakdown, of course, we have our campus craziness segment. For today's campus craziness, we've got to talk about Stanford leftists' insanity. I've heard, this is what I've heard, I don't know, that Stanford is supposed to be the Harvard of the West Coast. But it seems like the only thing Harvard and Stanford students have in common is great inflation and large egos, which of course makes them very, very fragile and unreceptive of views that are different from their own. Not unlike the crazy Berkeley lefties we deal with just up the road from Stanford every single day. And of course, similar to when Ben Shapiro visited Berkeley in 2017, Stanford students are absolutely losing their minds and pulling all sorts of childish nonsense in what I guarantee will be an unsuccessful attempt to shut down down Ben Shapiro's lecture tonight at 7 p.m. So Stanford students became a little hysterical, scratch that, very hysterical when a when the student group who invited Shapiro announced that he'd be coming to campus. They became they became so hysterical, in fact, that even some blue check marks affiliated with some of the student groups, namely Stanford's SJP, Stanford Students for Justice in Palestine Club, created and disseminated incredibly anti-Semitic cartoons on social media. And as Hurricane Shapiro has been bearing down on the campus, Campus, the pettiness and hyperbolic rhetoric has only been heating up. According to YAF, students attempting to promote the event through flyering on campus and in dorms were actively harassed and their flyers were destroyed or vandalized. The posters, featuring the title of the lecture, Facts Don't Care About Your Feelings, were vandalized, removed, or replaced with some vulgar messages and others with different flyers from the paid RAs of the residence hall after they were taken down. One flyer had tacks over Shapiro's face and a cross or T-shape, almost resembling the crosshairs of a weapon, kind of, with the message, my sexuality doesn't care about your feelings. What? <laughs> my sexuality doesn't care about your feelings? Well, I mean, I hope it cares about somebody's feelings, because if not, I feel very, very bad for you to say the least. But another poster had a giant and, uh, uh, let's say, a detailed <laughs> um, penis drawn over Ben's face and a note next to it that read, oops, my hand slipped, which is incredibly immature, but it's also a little funny because, uh, you know, I guess to me, I am a little bit uh, immature myself when it comes to comedy. But those aren't even the craziest or most telling responses about the selfishness, childishness, and depravity of the current generation of left-wing students. After postering in the Nordelfa dorm, the, cons the Stanford Conservative Club's members found their posters removed with a note from the RAs being put in its place. We, the Nordelfa staff, care about you, your feelings, your physical and emotional health, the note read. And it continued, we welcome and center the voices that some people wish to specifically marginalize and target. In that way, we support black people, people of color, non-binary folks, LGBTQIA folks, Muslims and Jews. People from diverse backgrounds learning and flourishing together is what makes Stanford and Nordelfa special. Thank you for being you. You are a star. And don't let anyone tell you you're not. Please reach out to any of us if you need to talk or need us to support you in any way. With love, your Nordelfa staff. 
rocket emoji. My god. Yeah, yeah, we're totally welcoming of all people unless they uh, tend to like Ben Shapiro and believe that facts don't care about your feelings and voted for President Trump in 2016. We care about all of those marginalized groups unless they lean conservative <laughs> is basically what they're telling any student uh, by tearing down those posters and leaving up that joke of a note. I mean, you are a star and don't let anyone tell you you're not. Oh my God, is this a 2012 Katy Perry song? I mean, seriously. And what a beautiful piece of irony this all is, right? It, it's perfect. And it's not only like a, a really good piece of irony, but tearing down a poster that doesn't make a political statement that is undoubtedly true, right? Facts don't care about your feelings. They don't. It's, it's an objective fact. And then tearing down that poster to create space, as the left would say, some sort of space to affirm Stanford students' left-wing politics and protect their fragile feelings is precisely why Ben and his large and growing following of young conservatives have adopted this mantra. I mean, any sane person sees something like this and they start laughing and think to themselves, my God, they have lost their minds. All they had to do was not be crazy. All they had to do was ignore the lecture and let the lecture go on without creating major disruptions that will create national headlines and, and only grow Ben's platform. But they just can't do it. And incidents like this only serve to validate Ben's message. Of course, that's the beautiful piece in all of this for someone who wants to see the conservative movement succeed. Of course, it is incredibly annoying and people shouldn't be vandalizing other people's property but it reveals the extent of the problem it reveals how widespread this flawed worldview and the problems associated with it actually are on college campuses when we say facts don't care about your feelings everyone says oh wow that's kind of a that's kind of a cheap shot that's kind of condescending that's kind of uh, inconsiderate well of course that's precisely what we're trying to be we're trying to be devoid of emotion when we're trying to talk about rationality and logic but to an increasing degree in this era people cannot separate the two and i don't have to sell, spell this out to you right you know a fact is a fact it's something that is either objectively true or as close to objectively true as possible and its validity is completely irrelevant to your reaction when you're presented with that information and this is where postmodernism which is the philosophical grounds that underpin in the prioritization of feelings over facts come into conflict with what values are traditionally associated with liberalism. And we'll dig into all that during my breakdown where we'll talk about the left's embracement of censorship of political speech on Twitter that they and they alone deem illegitimate, hateful, or untrue. But back to our story coming out of Stanford. Apparently, when the conservative student group attempted to enter Stanford's Hispanic-focused dorm, Casa Zapata, which for the record, Zapata was a thief, a murderer, and kind of a quasi-warlord. When they were attempting to enter Casa Zapata, they were met with a mob of screaming leftists who hurled expletives at their chapter members. The unhinged leftists block the students from entering the dorm and proceed to follow the conservative students to other dorms where the students were trying to post flyers and encouraged the staff in those buildings to not let the conservative students inside. Side. Stephen Stills, the president of the Stanford Conservative Group, told Young America's Foundation that a jeering mob assembled to block us from entering the dorm. We were turned away from the door exclusively because we were postering for the Ben Shapiro lecture. When I asked to see if there's a way I could speak to the resident fellow of the dorm, I was told by one of the residents to go suck a bleep. <laughs> That's great. To hell with civility. Go suck a bleep. <laughs> My god. Stills goes on to tell Yaf that after leaving and heading over to other dorms to poster, they had been followed by a group of eight students. They shouted obscenities, heckling the students, and kept them from entering the other dorms. Stills said that he had never before been so afraid on campus. Truly, how could the university police department not get wind of this, given that they should have been, if they weren't already, on high alert in the lead up to this lecture, especially given Stanford's embarrassing handling of previous events held by conservative students on campus in the recent past? Where are the damned police on these college campuses? I've been saying this for years. The university and their police departments have a sworn duty to protect the students on these campuses, even if that comes at the expense of some students feeling nervous by the police presence because they've accepted the false notion that, that policing is a racist practice and that the American police is a racist institution that kills people of color will and willy-nilly, which, of course, they're not. And guess what? The only way to reaffirm these students that the police department is a neutral arbiter of the law is for them to actually enforce it irrelevant of politics or race or any other metric. And it's the same story in a lot of high-crime urban areas that are 
disproportionately minority communities throughout this country. We need more policing and more enforcement of the law and not less. The police are not breaking the laws. The police are not drivers of theft and violent crime in your area. Usually it's their absence that is doing so. But it gets even crazier from there. The conservative students were later accused of targeting Casa Zapata because it was an ethnic-themed dorm. Angry leftists even discussed potential disciplinary actions against the group at a meeting with Stanford's provost, Persis Drell. Of course this is laughable, because if, you lis- if you've been listening to this podcast for the last five minutes, you know that these students were visiting every dorm posting flyers, so obviously that accusation does not pass the smell test. Stephen Sills went on to say that it is shameful that the same mob of people who used mob-like tactics to target conservatives would then turn around and accuse us of deliberately targeting the dorm. Stephen Sills actually turned out to be a Hispanic American. He says, as a Hispanic American conservative, I find it disgraceful that a minority of students within the residency were willing to engage in censorious behavior to prevent other students from hearing conservative ideas. I also think that it's extremely important to point out that all this intense triggering was caused by an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper for a completely optional event students could choose to attend or otherwise completely ignore. That's absolutely right, Stephen. Keep doing what you're doing over there. You're doing real Really, really good work. I know it's so annoying to deal with people who act like children all the time. I mean, you didn't go to Stanford thinking that you were going to be a babysitter for a few hundred students that can't deal with other ideas. But seriously, keep up your good work. You guys are going to have a great time tonight with Ben Shapiro and Palo Alto. But the flyering isn't the end of the story. On November 5th, YAF reported that a banner made by the conservative group to promote the event had gone missing by 1 p.m. the next day. YAF reported that a banner that was posted on November Number fourth, made by the conservative group to promote the event, had gone missing by 1 p.m. the following day. Lo and behold, just hours later, a new banner appeared that mocked the conservative students, implying that, that the conservative group was complicit in racism for hosting Shapiro. The banner read, Be tolerant, except racism. A spokesman for the club confirmed to Young America's Foundation that a police report had been filed and that the authorities were investigating the incident. Good! Again, good. Since the police have been utterly absent up to this point with regards to threats levied to students and Shapiro on social media, as well as the mobs that have harassed students and already destroyed their property previously, I mean, apparently they can. these police need all the help that they can get when it comes to cracking down on this childish behavior that these, student, that these leftist students are trying to pass off as resistance. On top of that, new video evidence captured leftists mopping over sidewalk chalk advertisements. I mean, my goodness, could you imagine being so threatened by someone else's ideas that you went out of your way to find or buy a mob and then wait until the middle of the night to watch to wash off sidewalk chalk with basic information about an event. I mean, that seems like a lot of effort that only served to promote the lecture to a wider audience as well as raise money for the organization that puts the uh, that puts all these events together like this. Because, you know, what is the end result of all this? Of course, the lecture sold out in like five minutes. People are craving a conservative viewpoint on college campuses. And the wait list, it's hundreds of names long. So people are wanting to go see Ben Shapiro and they're only more interested in going to see him when leftists when leftist students act in the predictable way that they do and i want to kind of make a a statement about how we should treat different segments of the left on campus the leftists at stanford can be divided into two main groups i've discovered the first group is the intellectual vanguards i often talk about and rip on when it comes to the left remember i always say it's not your everyday middle of the road democrat i mean these are the intellectual vanguard of the left that are playing the political power dynamic game. These folks are the ones that are so threatened by Shapiro's ability to convince people and at least create cracks in the leftist orthodoxy that dominates Stanford's campus using factual, rational, well-thought-out speech that is 100% protected by the First Amendment, that their only solution to ensure the continuation of their dominance is to shut down Shapiro's speech and are more than willing to spit in the face of the First Amendment to see that goal come to fruition. And the second group is predominantly made up of students that are the products of the circumstances and the atmosphere and campus culture created by the first 
group of leftists, right? The intellectual vanguard. They have been protected by the left wing bubble Stanford provides for their students. They haven't been exposed to well thought out arguments from the other side for the entirety of their education, which has resulted in students with weak commands of history, weak and wavering principles they can't defend, all while being incredibly susceptible to being whipped up into these childish frenzies. I mean, it's equally parts pathetic and sad because they've bought into this belief system and now the intellectual vanguard of the left has them exactly where they want them, which is why you need to keep bringing YAF speakers to campus. You need to keep doing your part on campus to make sure that the left doesn't control the entirety of campus culture. You need to have your own form of resistance, if you will. And YAF is more than happy to help you do that. And to close out the segment, I have to tell you more about YAF, Young America's Foundation, and their on-campus lectures coming up in the next week. If you've ever listened to this podcast, you know YAF brings the biggest names in conservatism to your school or to a university near you to equip you with the information and education you need to combat the leftist orthodoxy on your campus. So, of course, Ben Shapiro tonight at Stanford in the Memorial Auditorium at 7 p.m. for free. So make sure you go see Ben speak. You may know that we hosted Ben at Berkeley in 2017. Antifa welcomed him not so pleasantly, and Daily Wire leftist tear tumblers all over the country were overflowing all night long. So make sure to go see him for free at Stanford tonight. It's going to be a great night. So visit www.yaf.org forward slash events for more information. Also, Dinesh D'Souza will be speaking at the University of Pennsylvania on November 12th at the arch again for free so if you're in the philadelphia area go check it out and if you're not on the west coast or the eastern seaboard but instead you got a little bit of twang or drawl and love good sweet tea well Stephen moore author of trumponomics and former economic advisor to the trump administration will be speaking at the university of alabama on november 12th in 1016 north lawn hall again for free so if you're interested in any of these events or interested in learning more about yaf's other on-campus events or conferences visit yaf.org org forward slash events all right with all that stanford drama god i hate stanford you know even though i have my disagreements with berkeley i'm cal bears football till i die so um thank goodness i have to i can stop talking about stanford finally uh, now it's time for bradley's breakdown right we're going to talk about twitter deciding to censor all political advertisements on their website. In a Twitter thread last Wednesday, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey announced that Twitter will be banning all political ads to target disinformation and election interference. And here's Jack's Twitter thread, right? I'm going to read it in full so you get all of the information that Jack's put out so far. Of course, there are still things pending with the policy, um, which we'll get to in a few minutes. So here's at Jack on October 30th. 2019. We've made the decision to stop all political advertising on Twitter globally. We believe political message reach should be earned, not bought. Why? A few reasons. A political message earns reach when people decide to follow an account or retweet. Paying for reach removes that decision, forcing highly optimized and targeted political messages on people. We believe this decision should not be compromised by money. While internet advertising is incredibly powerful and very effective for commercial advertisers, that power brings significant risk to politics where it can be used to influence votes and affect the lives of millions. Internet political ads present entirely new challenges to civic discourse, machine learning based optimization of messaging and micro targeting, unchecked misleading information and deep fakes, all at increasing velocity, sophistication and overwhelming scale. These challenges will affect all internet communication, not just political ads. Best to focus our efforts on the root problems without the additional burden and complexity taking taking money brings. Trying to fix both means fixing ni neither well and harms our credibility. For instance, it's not credible for us to say, we're working hard to stop people from gaming our systems to spread misleading info, but if someone pays us to target and force people to see their political ads, well, they can say whatever they want. Winky face emoji. We considered stopping only candidate ads, but issue ads present a way to circumvent. Additionally, it isn't fair for everyone but candidates to buy ads for issues they want to push, so we're stopping these too. We're well aware we're a small part of a large of a much larger political advertising ecosystem. Some might argue our actions today could favor incumbents, but we have witnessed many social media movements reach massive scale without any political advertising. I trust this will only grow. We need more forward-looking political ad regulation. Very difficult to do. Ad, transpa ad transparency requirements are progress, but not enough. The internet provides entirely new capabilities, and regulators need to think past the present day to ensure a level playing field. 
We'll share the final policy by November 15th, including a few exceptions. Ad and support of voter registration will still be allowed, for instance. We'll start enforcing our new policy on November 22nd to provide current advertisers a notice period before this change goes into effect. A final note, this isn't about free expression, even though it is, it totally is. Uh, This is about paying for reach. And paying to increase the reach of political speech has significant ramifications that today's democratic infrastructure may not be prepared to handle. It's worth stepping back in order to address. So that's his full Twitter thread. And Twitter had long allowed political ads, though it had been taking steps to recently curtail them, especially after the 2016 presidential election, when Twitter started requiring advertisers to verify their identities, and it published a database of political ads that ran on its service. And this announcement, of course, comes on the heels of Mark Zuckerberg's testimony on Capitol Hill, where he said he wasn't going to acquiesce to either side's request, at least openly in public statements, to be the ultimate decider of truth on these matters. So, of course, the media is setting this up as some sort of big clash between the two tech giants. Kate Conger over at the New York Times is among those phrasing it this way. She says the move sets up a clash of principle with Facebook and Mr. Zuckerberg, who this month who this month said he would allow politicians to run any claims, even false ones, in ads on the social network. Mr. Zuckerberg reasoned that Facebook had been founded to give people a voice and said his company stood for free expression. Political ads, he said, were newsworthy. As I said before, Democrats have ramped up their attacks against Mr. Zuckerberg and Facebook. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York praised Twitter and said, if a company cannot or does not wish to run basic fact checking on paid political advertising, then they should not run paid political ads at all. Governor Governor Steve Bullock of Montana, who is running for president, tweeted, good, your turn, Facebook. Bill Russo, a spokesman for the Biden campaign, said that it was unfortunate to suggest that the only way to deal with false claims in political ads was to not run the ads at all. But he added that it was encouraging that, for once, revenue did not win out. Ah, uh, yes, I'm I'm sure Jack Dorsey is just so worried about c- civility and, and the impact on our democratic institutions that, ultimately, he no longer cares about the bottom line. I mean, of course, that's foolish. Uh, Jack Dorsey's trying to get some goodwill, of course, with the liberal media, and probably sees regulation coming in the near future for these types of political advertisements, which is why he's just getting out of the game now, even though I still think it's wrong. That's probably the, the business calculation behind that. But it goes beyond Biden and AOC and, and Governor Steve Bullock. Two weeks ago, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts called out Mr. Zuckerberg and Facebook after he testified on Capitol Hill for operating a disinformation for-profit machine. But the funny thing is, she and all the other leading Democratic presidential candidates have advertised on Twitter, as has President Trump. Trump's re-election campaign. So going after, I mean, I know I'm kind of using Twitter and Facebook interchangeably, and you're like, wow, you sound like a boomer because you're not us- you're not using uh, distinct terms when you're talking about f- Facebook and Twitter. But we're just talking about you know tech industry, tech advertising in general, right? They've all used these services before, both right and left especially according to Twitter's database of political ads. On the Facebook side of things, in a pretty unfortunate twist, because Facebook employs a bunch of recently graduated leftists that got their education from universities turned indoctrination centers in California, they hired a bunch of people that aren't actually committed to Facebook's purpose, vision, or principles. Hundreds of these leftist employees signed a letter to Mr. Zuckerberg asking him to reconsider how the company treats political ads. Brad Parscale, Mr. Trump's campaign manager for the 2020 election, said that Twitter's decision was a part an act intended to silence conservatives and that it was a very dumb decision for (laughs) Twitter. That's a quote, by the way, a very dumb decision for Twitter's shareholders. And he wondered if Twitter would also stop running ads from biased liberal media outlets that attacked Republicans. Of course, the ban on political ads doesn't eliminate the toxicity that Twitter and Facebook faces with political speech on their forums, but all this leads to a broader point beyond just speech or paid for political speech on Twitter and Facebook. And I think it's something that has deeply infected our body politic today. Actually, there are two broader points that I want to talk about. The first is the siphoning of society, that people on the right and the left are so fed up with each other's nonsense and so fed up with their respective attempts to shift the Overton window. Of course, this is a much larger phenomenon on the left because they abuse the levers of culture and government much more than the right, but and, you know it still exists on the right in some limited forms, that the right and left can no longer not only bear to hear out the other side of a political argument, but we can't even bear to have that content appear on our social media feeds, for example. I mean, we block people and we attempt to shut people's speeches on universities down, and more and more we refuse to associate with people from the other side. When we do things like that, we end up creating our own echo chambers. When we usually talk about conservatives that set up these echo chambers, usually it's 
it's in the form of self-selection. We self-select it into it on social media by blocking or muting people or refusing to follow CNN or read the New York Times or follow AOC on social media, media platforms. And actually, conservatives are doing it increasing amounts in the real world by moving out of places like California and heading to Texas or Arizona. The left, on the other hand, they are all too willing to go directly after the lovers of government and culture, as I said, because it's not enough for them to control the universities, Hollywood, the media, and culture more broadly, and then self-select within those respective spheres. No, it is the mere existence and presence of that differing worldview that is you know, played out in speech and action that's not always political but often politicized that they often disagree that they ultimately disagree with. And this siphoning of society is precisely what got us to where we are today on college campuses. And as I said before, the issue cuts centrally to the new left's defining philosophies, neo-Marxism, postmodernism, and intersectionality. A cross-section of these ideologies, when taken to their logical extremes, serves as the impetus for the left's newfound fondness for anti-First Amendment positions, whether that is conflating speech with violence on college campuses, and then justifying said violence as a form of payback for historically marginalized groups, or wanting to ban your political opponents from speaking in public forums or on forums like Twitter and Facebook, and then using the guise of misinformation, which secretly encompasses any speech they don't like or disagree with, to go after them, right? And these both serve to conflate speech that the left disagrees with, with an imminent threat to people or institutions or even violence towards certain people and institutions in some case, which is why they've been broadening what constitutes this taboo or disqualified speech, specifically since the 2016 election since the 2016 election that they refused to own and accept that they lost. I mean, the left went after like a meme last week for disinformation when it showed the dog who hunted down the world's most notorious terrorist being rewarded the medal of Pawner. Pawner. And they made a big deal out of it saying that it was a doctored photo. Of course it was a doctored photo. The dog was in front of President Trump receiving a fake medal, you dolts. My goodness. Right, but as I was saying, the left has tried to reclassify speech that undercuts their worldview, regardless of the evidence supporting the argument that undercuts their worldview, as hate speech or violence. And after they've been largely successful in that effort internationally, especially in Europe, and sadly in many parts of this country that dominates industries vital to our success as a society like Hollywood and our universities, they're now going after the speech that they couldn't outright rule hateful or violent despite their new broadened definition. This is why they're happy with Twitter's decision. This is why they're mad at Facebook. This is why many of the Democrats intend to control the infrastructure, disseminate information that is already in place and increase the barriers to entry in these types of industries. That is why the Democrats intent is to control the infrastructure to disseminate information that is already in place and then increase the barriers to entry in these types of industries. And of course, they'll kill two birds with one stone regulation. The internet has widely decentralized the dissemination of information, which to anyone should be seen as a social good. Of course, there are its obvious and glaring downsides, but it's truly elevated everyone who has access. More voices are better, more inclusion, more learning, more power to the individual. I mean, at one point, this is precisely some of the things that liberals stood for. But of course, the new socialist democratic left has determined that this is only good or useful insofar that they can control it, which is why they're walking back on all of these, these traditionally liberal principles in the name of misinformation. And they're making the silly argument that misinformation is so widespread that it has fundamentally changed the way human beings view and then process information, that now it's in incumbent on the government to step in and establish a pseudo ministry of truth in cahoots with their allies at the mainstream media companies that would love to see nothing more than a re-centralization of political advertisements and political speech towards their network so that they can profit off of it while controlling the narrative. And the left knows that with Twitter and Facebook removed as obstacles when it comes to advertising, it will essentially be a system where mainstream media effectively functions even more effectively now that, that the dissemination of information has been re-centralized as the propaganda wing for the Democratic Party. With the over-the-top and absurd puff pieces coming from CNN and the New York Times and the Washington Post that are run on a regular basis in favor of the left, right? They had a, a Washington Post op-ed on, on the glories of Adam Schiff, on Shifty Schiff, as well as a theater critic writing a puff piece on Elizabeth Warren's command of, of the stage and of the audience. I mean, they, they just get ridiculous. They get more and more ridiculous every single time. But do you really think that these that these media companies that write these great glorious puff pieces about Democrats will give conservatives and the right a fair shake when it comes to advertisements in their publications? I doubt it because, I mean, a ABC or CNN or whichever one of those networks hosted the Democratic debate, I believe, in October 
in October or September, they got ripped by the left for allowing a conservative group to run an ad during one of the Democratic debates. So with all that said, I think it's time to bring in an expert in the field. Justin Corbin will be joining us to discuss this issue further in a new segment I like to call Pros and Cons, where I interview either a professional in a political field, whether that's an issue topic or something that relates to politics more generally, and cons, cons being conservative activists. So Justin is a little bit of both, and I'm so excited to have him on as the first ever guest in the new segment, Pros and Cons. All right, joining me now to discuss the Twitter ban on political advertisements and all things digital strategy. I mean, he's kind of a wizard when it comes to this stuff. Justin Corbin, he is the co-founder of Jumpstart Strategies, specifically implementing successful digital strategies. He has been on over 30 winning media campaigns. He has served as the national media director of the Black Conservative Movement for nine months now, and he's grown them to a media following of over 100 thousand people. So congratulations to you for that, Justin. And also thank you for being the first ever guest on the elephant in the room with Bradley Devlin. So I am looking at this Twitter ban. I'm looking at Twitter's ban on political advertisements. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, this is one heck of a curveball for guys like you in in your industry in the digital media strategy industry. What is the uh, ramifications of a policy like this when it comes to running your business? Yeah, so so that's it's actually very interesting. So as far as the ramifications of, of a Twitter ban of, of conservatives as a whole, I mean, there's this is this is a multifaceted issue. And I think the last person really affected is someone in digital strategy. I think it's 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 we're the last ones to get hit by it, because the people who who do get banned from Twitter, they're normally people who are going to go and and make a case for to, to Twitter directly. Whereas for us, it's it's something where it, when we don't have to handle that, that's, that's very nice. But no, I think I think it's it's important because we have to ask uh, who controls the platform. And the answer is, is very clearly the, the liberals Jack Dorsey's made made that very clear, even when testifying before Congress. That, that some people are, are afraid to step up and, and even come out as conservative within Twitter because of how liberal the actual company is. So when you look at who controls the platform, it, it really clearly shows that that it's it's not really too uh, too ridiculous that there is a ban on conservative users and, and quieting those voices that are that are speaking up and, and voices like like you, you should even be more affected by it with you have a large Twitter following. So be careful what you tweet. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually super nervous about this type of stuff. I mean, cancel culture has come. Of course, everyone can agree when the cancel culture comes from the ne- comes for the neo-Nazis and the KKK and the white supremacists that everyone's kind of OK with that. Like, oh, yeah, they, they I revile their views. But at the same time, this is a public forum. This is a platform. The answer to speech, of course, is more speech. If we truly believe that our ideas and our ideals have made America the most prosperous country in the world, in the world and has made the world more prosperous in general than any point in history, we should be able to defend our values in front of these these absolute scum. And I got to say, Jack Dorsey is such a dope. I I hate Jack Dorsey. I mean, have you have you seen this stuff? He goes to like Myanmar on like a two week vacation and he meditates for like 72 hours with some monk in this mosquito infested uh, mosquito infested cave where he gets bit by like 80 mosquitoes. I, it's on his Twitter. It's the, the craziest thing in the world. I think that these, these liberals are so high um, on their own egos. It, it's, it's painful to watch sometimes, but you know, you probably saw this. A lot of this is based off of political misinformation, right? The left is making the argument that I think is kind of a flawed argument, right? Because as I said, as I said before, the answer to improper speech to a factual speech to um, evil speech is more good, rational dialogue. Um, that being said, do you think that this is about misinformation and and Russian interference in the 2016 election? Or is this just the left trying to make sure um, that the right does not continue their uh, I mean, you know, the left can't meme, right? <laughs> the right dominates the meme game. Do you, do you think that it's it's uh, they're afraid of the right's presence and the decentralization of information that these platforms have provided? 
You know, I think there are there are certainly Russian accounts and there's there's certainly Russian bots and and I'm sure agents behind these accounts. And and that certainly is something that you need to be wary of when you are running a campaign is they get out to vote and what effect other people have had whether on social media or or knocking doors on whether or not your campaign's going to win. So, it's certainly a relevant concern that that there'd be interference of some sort but but the whole russian interference thing has been the part of the, this entire witch hunt of, of something for for the dems to point a finger at in order to to pull credibility from from a potential possible outcome for example someone winning a campaign uh, a political campaign so so for us i mean there's it, it makes it more challenging when looking to run an ad because especially on on even facebook now facebook has multi faceted verification processes to be even able to to pay for a boosted political post so i mean we're we're talking uh, social security number and and getting mail from them with verification numbers that you send back it took us almost a month to get everything completely set up and be able to run they they also recently changed the rules and and ma- they added a 52 page information packet on the rules change and how to how to work with it 52 pages for for the back end of facebook is a little too complex and uh <laughs> so no that's just another way where they're 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 working to make sure that that people who are running the ads are living in the united states and are real people they have an address they're registered to vote that kind of stuff so so in a sense it's good that they're securing it that way but also it does remove the 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 loud voice people can have before who wanted to boost one of their own posts that's political. Right. I look at this and I say, okay, we can all agree on foreign interference in our election, you know, bot accounts or or Russian trolls or, or you know, Russian funded propaganda machines that are spreading disinformation. We should we should be targeting those 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 political advertisements as American companies. You know, they have a duty to protect somewhat of a duty to protect the society that gave them this opportunity to have this platform. Right. The society that gave them the the opportunity to have these users to see to see these cash flows come in. And, you know, we can all agree on on. On the Russian aspect of this thing. But I'm sitting here and I'm saying, wow, this is a recentralization of information, right? That that Facebook and Twitter and these social media tech giants, they've radically decentralized information. And now you see the mainstream media and the Democrats working in cahoots with the liberals who are working in the tech industry, right? I mean, this sounds like some vast left-wing conspiracy now, um, but I really do think that they are working to recentralize that information so that they can um, have a monopolization of what's deemed to be legitimate political discourse. Does that worry you in the future in your industry as well as um, a conservative activist who's trying to secure wins for the conservative movement? Yeah, I mean, that, that worries me in, in in more ways than just the, the digital activism. I mean, that's that's just us not having a voice on, on these platforms and not being able to reach potential voters. And I mean, that's how, how that, that decentralization of, of information there, that's how we do fall behind is because the, the facts are on our side, but are not always presented. So if, 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 if you can remove a, a channel of, of what, what we find to be truths from the internet, then, then we're, we're looking at, at first, first amendment violations. And, and I mean, there's, there's a lot to it. I mean, it's it's certainly certainly not good for 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 me if if conservatives who are on these platforms are are not uh, given voices and not allowed to run advertisements and stuff like that because I mean that would put me out of business. So I mean, quite literally, that that would that would put us out of business if these these tech companies, uh, if if Elizabeth Warren gets elected. If these tech companies are are all shut down, or if the the ads are are stopped, so yeah, there's certainly. I mean, for for us who we were only work with conservatives, we only work with Republicans. For us, if they don't have a platform, then then we don't have a job, right? And I and I look at this, and and you know, Elizabeth Warren's grand central plan for everything, right? She's got a five year plan for everything. It seems like these days. Um, but I look at that, and I I think, okay, if you're going to ban political advertisements outright, like Twitter does. I'm afraid. I don't know. I'm I'm not 
as well versed in in this type of stuff as as you are clearly but i sit here and i think hmm that's going to have market alternatives that aren't going to be um nearly as benevolent people are going to start uh you know buying bot followers or things like that or buying accounts in order to just accumulate retweets right because the only way that you can forward those political messages is through legitimate verified accounts or you know legitimate twitter accounts um that are that are that is either the candidates or your own personal account or your own business account right and i see them turning i see these these different uh, individuals or entities turning towards riskier forms of disseminating that information. And that could be in the form of Russian bots, right? That could be in the form of bots that go out and, and keep retweeting these tweets in order to get um, in order to get a larger audience. What do you feel about that? Is that at all possible? Um, or am I just am I just off my rocker and have been watching a little too much Hannity? <laughs> well, no, I think I think there's some validity to it, depending on so the the Twitter crackdown is is on, hopefully on all Russia bots. So their goal would be, while it would be terrible for someone to to turn to those unpredictable channels to buy retweets and and stuff like that, it's quite likely that if they're doing what they're saying they're doing by removing these accounts, the accounts that would be coming from those websites to retweet those posts would hopefully be already banned. So so if they're doing what they're saying, that's a, a first of all a protection against people going to those websites and buying retweets. But no, I certainly think that, I mean, that's, it's certainly, I don't think a very targeted form of advertising, but certainly something to be wary about. And I mean, a direct turn to Russia there for, for interference and, and just to get some clicks on posts. All right. It, we got a little bit of time left before I got to get out of here. So I want to ask you one last question, and that is how much do you think it's going to cost these tech giants i mean even though they are you know flush with liquidity i mean they have no problems whatsoever when it comes to revenue streams um when it comes to advertising right but how expensive is it for them to if they were to be required by legislation to fact check all of these different political advertisements right even though twitter's banned them outright um instead of actually going you know they took a scorched earth kind of policy instead of actually going through item by item but if facebook were if they keep running political ads and then they were forced by legislation to fact check all of these different political advertisements how much money do you think that would cost facebook how how much do you think that would cost facebook in the long run i mean you don't have to put a number on it but i i would think it would be immense right oh yeah and and that's why so that's something that Elizabeth Warren wants to do. And that's why Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, he was he was just making headlines for meeting with the president, because I mean, he understands that 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 the the wind's not on his side in the the new socialist Democrat Party. And and Mark Zuckerberg has threatened to sue the government if Elizabeth Warren becomes president, because she wants to get rid of them and, and get rid of these big tech channels. So I think I think there's there's a lot more worries on the the side of these these typically liberal companies these these social media giants because they don't want to they they can't honestly afford to, to to go to war with the entire federal government. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for stopping by, Justin. You were a great first guest to have on the podcast. If you don't know, me and Justin met at the Heritage Foundation's YLP internship. Um, he's a good friend of mine. So thank you so much for having you, uh, for coming on the show. We are welcome. Uh, you are welcome back anytime, my friend. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Awesome. You too. All right. That was my great interview with Justin Corbin. Follow him on Instagram and Twitter at Corbin JT. That's C O R B I N J T. It was great having him on. I love talking to that guy. He is one of the most fun guys I met at my internship. Uh, all around great guy. And he's going to be incredibly successful. I already know it. Everyone already knows it when you come into contact with this kid. Um, so I, you know, I told you we'd have a good episode today. Episode five. It's been two weeks. I'm, I'm energetic. I'm ready to go. It's early morning on a Thursday, but here we go with how about that. We have to shift away from the tech. I know it's a lot. It's, there's a lot going on with the tech. It's confusing. I'm even confused. I almost was a little worried to talk about it because I'm like, 
I'm going to start going off on Alex Jones type tirades with the different uh, bots and uh, you know, all of that. But we have to turn to Howl about that now. And we're going to be talking about Lexi Lonis's piece on what to do if you are offended on campus. So, Lexi, congratulations for being chosen for Howl about that. Uh, I thought this piece was great given what we were we are talking about today. A little bit of civility and free speech in politics goes a long way way and we need to be reminded of that regardless of what side of the political aisle we fall on. So apparently Lexi's impetus for writing this article was actually an incident that happened on her campus. Apparently one day before her classes started this semester, another student told her that any man accused of sexual harassment is guilty no matter if there is evidence against them or not. I mean, man, I hope this wasn't a guy because if he was, he should be canceled for mansplaining. That's how that works, right? <laughs> She's got to be canceled for mansplaining. Uh, but regardless, and, and, and you know, good on Lexi for this. She says that she finds this type of statement foolish, which which is important. I, I think that this is, a, it, this is a foolish statement. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't look into these types of sexual impropriety um, that can result in, in abuse and violence and, and, uh, and taking advantage of other individuals. I mean, I think it is horrible, but we just can't say without any evidence that if they are accused, they are guilty outright, right? But as Lexi points out, it is good to hear these students out because it provides an opportunity to learn from people all over the world who might not share the same beliefs as you. And that's exactly what you do in college. It's the purpose of education. And it's the purpose of education, right? To become not only educated, but also to learn how to properly convince and debate with people or act civilly when you eventually have a job or are managing conflict in the workplace. If you haven't been exposed to some absurd argument that's close to your heart or something of that nature before, this can be hard, especially if the person in question is one of authority, like a GSI or a teacher's aide or a professor, and they hit a nerve. So of course, before the debate or conversation ensues, First, it's important to figure out what type of conversation it's going to be. Is it going to be a civil discussion where you purposefully engage and probe politely to draw more information out of one another? Or is it a debate where you're trying to defeat one another in order to convince those in the audience or surrounding you? Or is it just going to be a one-sided lecture where you listen politely and ask questions respectfully? And remember, the best way to learn on your campus is to talk to people you disagree with. You might think their views are crazy, but if you only invest your time in learning your chosen side of the argument, you won't be an effective communicator against the other side in the long run. Always be open to learning. A calm discussion can go a long way in making a new friend or broadening your horizons. You probably won't agree in the end, but it will be worth your time to understand your own views better. And if you have the opportunity and they seem receptive, start sharing your views. Sharing what you believe on campus might seem scary and you might get some pushback. However, the only way your peers will learn is if you tell them, and that is especially true with the left's domination of campus culture and material being learned inside the campus classroom. In the end, if you can't commit to being civil and calm and respectful, you're more than welcome to walk away respectfully. But you should know that if you're unable to handle yourself by either walking away or engaging in civil discussion, then there is no way you can survive your classes, much less a job in the real world, regardless if it is in the private or public sector. You should embrace that challenge. And of course, this calculation becomes a little bit more complicated when you're dealing with someone in a position of authority. When it comes to dealing with a professor or a GSI or a TA, it's important to initially give them the benefit of the doubt. Even though their opinions may be a heaping pile of flaming garbage, trust me, I've had my fair share at Berkeley, it doesn't mean that they won't be interested in discussing your political opinions more in depth during their office hours. If they are open-minded, it is in your best interest to foster a relationship with that professor or that GSI or that TA because those discussions can challenge and grow your beliefs. More than that, a solid recommendation from a prominent liberal professor that considered you an intellectual adversary can go a long way when applying for internships, postgraduate education, or jobs. And once you visit office hours, I think you'll be able to determine if and how your leftist professor might might grade you down for your political opinions, and then you can act accordingly. And if it seems as if your professor will take your conservative values out on you through your GPA, I'm not advocating for regurgitating the professor's lies or incorrect opinions simply because they have control over your grade. I think there's a middle ground that recognizes the arguments that your professor is presenting in class while giving it your own spin. If your professor is particularly combative and you're a student with ambitions to go to law school, graduate school, or any other postgraduate education, sacrificing your GPA could have serious consequences when it may really matter for your career. So be tactful and tread carefully. 
So that does it for how about that this week. Thank you so much, Lexi, for that great piece. I think it's really, really good information because we all need to be reminded about how to conduct ourselves sometimes as we see civility uh, and our social fabric eroding before our eyes. You know, we, we need to be reminded of those core tenets of why America has become the greatest country on the history of the earth. And that, of course, all started with civility, right? John Adams said that the Constitution is for the governance of a moral people and a moral people only. And if we are devoid of those morals, our Constitution will fall by the wayside. And, and sadly, you know, I think we're seeing that more and more these days, especially in this 2020 Democratic presidential primary. So to close this out for today, I got to tell you about another awesome piece of merchandise available over at the Lone Conservative store. By buying our merch, you are helping us at Lone Conservative fund the creation of great new content that you crave, including this very podcast. So Lexi did a great job breaking down what a pain it can be to sit in class and listen to a leftist professor spew lies about American history or a leftist student spew lies about American history and America more generally, but you still got to get good grades in order to graduate. And that's why we bring you that type of content, right? That's we, we give you the information and, and the tool set to equip you to be a successful conservative activist and students. And of course, to get those good grades, as Lexi mentioned, that's why you need the best notebook. And it's got a great picture of Trump on the front of it that says, only the best notes, which, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty hilarious um, in my book. So shout out to the product designers over at the Lone Conservative team. You're doing a great job. For $12.50, you can have this notebook to, as I said, jot down your leftist professor's silly rants about how altruistic the USSR was, or, you know, do something better with your time like doodle in class. <laughs> so help us out by going to store.loneconservative.com or go to loneconservative.com and click on the shop button on the menu bar at the top of the page to get the best notebook all right that does us here for the fifth episode of the elephant in the room with bradley devlin this was a great episode i'm really really pleased with it i hope you're pleased with it as well and if you are pleased with it please follow us on spotify or soundcloud give us a five-star review like our twitter and our facebook pages and make sure to follow me on twitter at bradley devlin or on instagram at the brad dev thank you so much for tuning in we'll see you next time and we'll see you next time and we'll see you next time